All right, uh, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. It's a great pleasure to be your moderator today. My name is George Gray Molina. I am the chief economist for the Global Policy Bureau at UNDP. Uh, we have a stellar lineup and we have Professor Diego Sanchez Sancochea <coughs> today with us. I'll be introducing each of them in a few minutes, but let me start with a few words uh, of introduction on this topic. We'll be talking about the costs of inequality in Latin America with lessons and warnings for the rest of the world. Uh, and I think one of the issues that, that really comes to, to mind is that over the past weeks and months, we focused a lot on the emergency, on the COVID pandemic, on the pre-existing inequalities and the effects those had during the response. But in this webinar, we'd like to take a step back from that discussion and to think about this in a more historical, a more systemic view and think about what is it that uh, we are learning from a region in the world, which has been one of the most unequal uh, for the past 30 years, but also has had some successes in policymaking over the past few years. Uh, one of the powerful things, arguments that Diego Sanchez Ancochea makes uh, in, in this, in, in the book, is that it's not good enough to focus only on the determinants or on the drivers of different forms of inequality, but it's also important to look at the costs and the effects and think about the inequalities as a system in the ways in which loops and feedback loops between politics and society and the economy uh, reach back into uh, perpetuating inequalities, if you will. For those of us who've worked on poverty, on inequality in many parts of the world, uh, we know that inequality is a stubborn thing, that the reset button for many societies is discrimination, is exclusion, is inequality. So it's very hard to break through, very hard to break through the systemic loops, but also the equilibria uh, uh, across the field. So with that brief introduction, I think it's very exciting to have Diego with us in our panelists. I'll introduce each of them, and then I'll briefly uh, give some, some housekeeping um, advice. So let me start with our the guest of honor, Diego Sanchez Sancochea, uh, a good friend, a fantastic academic. He is professor of political economy um, at Oxford and head of, of the University of Oxford's Department of International Development. Uh, Diego has been working on the political economy of Latin America with a focus on Central America for, for many decades. Uh, his research has focused on issues of income inequality and the role of social policy. And his new book, The Cost of Inequality, which we'll talk about now, will be released in December 2020. Uh, welcome, Diego. It's a pleasure to have you. Our first panelist is going to be Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, who is a UN Assistant Secretary General, our Black Director, of course. Uh, Luis Felipe is an eminence on issues of inequality in Latin America. He's written some of the seminal, seminal papers uh, that, that have guided the discussion, but also has been active on the policy front from UNDP, from the World Bank, and also as an advisor to government. So we very look forward to, to your advice and how you see both the content of this discussion argument, but also the future, Luis Felipe. Uh, welcome. Uh, our second panelist is Linda McGuire. Uh, UNDP resident representative in Panama and also supervisor of the regional hub in Panama. Uh, Linda McGuire has over 20 years of experience with working on UNDP. In July, she wrote a very insightful blog piece called The Case for Governance, uh, which makes a case that effective governance is essential during the COVID response. So I'm going to turn to her to pick her brain about how she sees how this is related to the poverty and inequality challenge ahead of us. And finally, last but not least, uh, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Joy Kategekwa, uh, UNDP Regional Strategic Advisor for Africa. Uh, uh, Joy is a leading trade, investment, and development law and policy specialist with over 17 years of experience, including at the leadership level. She is now with us at New York City at the Regional Bureau for Africa. We're going to also ask for her advice on economic empowerment as a mean of, of tackling inequality. Welcome, Joy. Um, just as just a couple words of advice, we'll have a 30 minute presentation by Diego and then you can start to fill in questions in the chat box, if you will. So you'll see on the bottom of your screen, there's a chat box. You can write those up or you can also request the floor to, to make a succinct uh, and very illuminating question uh, after uh, introducing yourself to the panel. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. I'm very excited. I pass it over to my good friend and colleague, 
Professor Diego Sanchez Ancochea. Over to you. Thank you very much, George. Let me just make sure that this works and then, okay, your slide show. Um, so let me start by thanking um, George, um, as he says, a, a very, very um, good friend. It's always um, great to collaborate with him. Um, I guess I can only blame him for two things. The first is that um, this is taking place online and not in New York, which is much for more fun. And also the fact that he did say that I have been studying um, Central America for many decades. I'm not that old, so it's only two decades. <laughs> Um, and then um, to be very, I'm actually I'm very happy to both um, be presenting at UNDP for all that it means and um, to be sharing with, with a panel of people I know well, but also of um, new colleagues that I have met. Um, two caveats on, on what I'm going to present. Um, for those that are experts on Latin America, there will be very little new in the sense that this is not primary research, but this is very much an attempt to bring Latin America to other parts of the world and to think um, critically and creatively, I hope, about comparisons between regions and even between global north and global south that we don't um, do enough. Second, I'm going to try to um, be relatively brief, but that also means that many of the issues will be superficial and that I'm going to also discuss a big region as if it was all the same. I'm obviously there's huge differences between, um, say, Guatemala and Argentina, or between um, Uruguay and Mexico. So the starting point is uh, very much um, this quote um, by uh, Martin Wolf that came after I have actually written the book, but that I thought it was useful, um, in which he very much says, look, part of the world is increasingly looking uh, like Latin America both in economic, but also in terms of the political challenges. And this is in some ways something we know very well by the data. Um, so um, when we think about inequality as concentration of income, which I actually think is one of the most important dimensions that we need to think about, um, the concentration of income in the top 1% has increased across um, the OECD in almost every country, obviously, particularly, uh, significantly in the United States, the UK, uh, Poland, but also uh, in Germany or Ireland um, as well. And clearly, um, the US has been the, the most significant case. And in fact, many of the um, claims I'm going to make um, have underlying the message that the US is much more Latin American uh, than they care to admit. There you have a, um, a graph of um, where the growth has gone from 1980 to 2015, um, with a very large part of it going to the top 0.01%, while the bottom 50%, for example, has actually increased um, their income levels less than GDP per capita. But if we, that's what's happening, then those of us that work in Latin America and Latin America immediately think about the Latin American case, um, because for quite some time, um, it has been the, one of the most unequal regions in the world, and clearly not just that, uh, but inequality based on the concentration at the uh, very top. These are numbers that are based either in um, tax calculations or in the case of Mexico uh, on national accounts, but that tell us um, that the Latin American countries' share of the top 1% is probably higher um, than in uh, many other countries and clearly higher, for example, than in the US, despite all um, what we write about it. So the point is uh, of the book and of my, my comments today is very much what do we learn from Latin American history. And here, I have to say that when I started the book, it was very going to be very much about the cost. And um, thank goodness, I had a couple of friends um, telling me, but you also need to think about positive lessons. You need to, to think about what the region um, teaches positively, and I'm going to discuss that um, at the end, uh, because I think one of the underlying messages that might be important and useful for it, this audience is that we need to think much more not only about the global north, which is uh, in terms of development, which is the traditional way we have thought about this, but also what the global south, and in this case, Latin America teaches the global north about um, challenges, but also about um, ways of fighting. 
Um, and in thinking about this, I um, think there are four different costs, if I, I start with the negatives, um, that Latin American teaches and teaches from a historical perspective. Again, another element that I will have to highlight is I think inequality like uh, issues of governance that Luis Felipe and others have worked so much on needs to be thought always in historical perspective because they are about the long-term structure of the economy. So we have four different types of um, cost. The environmental one that sadly I don't discuss in the book, but that maybe we have time to discuss and I think it's an important area, but then the social, the political and the economic. Um, because of time and because I really want to talk for 30 minutes to give plenty of time for discussion, here I'm going to concentrate only on the economic cost and um, the political ones. So what are the, the political cost, the economic cost sorry, of the high concentration of income at the top in Latin America? I think they are at least three significant ones. The one, first one has to give, do with the long-term incentives to invest, initially to invest in education, more recently to invest in high quality education. So we have plenty of literature at which some um, people maybe in the audience have contributed, showing that how historically um, Latin American countries were way behind in terms of investment in education, particularly when compared to countries like the US and Canada. So by the beginning of the 20th century, um, only Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, and Uruguay had introduced mass primary education. That's 75 years later um, than um, Canada. Um, and the literacy rate was just 17% in Bolivia or 15% uh, in um, Brazil, compared to, again, almost 90% in Canada. And we have plenty of literature starting by Engerman and Sokolov, but also many of the structuralists within Latin America, uh, people like Cardoso and Faleto and others, um, that show very much that some of those problems have a lot to do with the incentives of the elite. An elite that saw education more as a problem in terms of a threat um, to their power than as an economic opportunity given their specialization in primary resources from very early on. Of course, things have changed uh, during the 20th century and 25th century very significantly. Um, the expansion first of primary education was quite uh, notable um, and then extended to secondary education, at least until the debt crisis. But we know that in this case, with very significant problems of um, quality and inequality in the uh, provision of the service. Um, that has translated in results of um, Ex international exams like the PISA exam, um, where Latin America has performed relatively poorly and also high, quite unequally. So just to give you um, some data, 63% um, of the children that participating uh, in the PISA uh, in math um, did not get the result, the uh, adequate results in the case of Latin America compared to just 23% in the wealthy countries and 9% in Asia Pacific. And again, also with very significant change, sorry, um, differences depending on whether you were going to a public or a private school or whether you were part of a wealthy uh, household or not. Um, um, this um, educational separation in terms of results obviously has uh, important both economic consequences in terms of uh, weaknesses in human capital in the region, but of course also in terms of politics. So um, the IDB and others have actually shown how there's a lack of interest of the upper middle class and the wealthy in improving education, basically because they are not using that uh, public education, but they are um, very much in the private system. There's also a lot of uh, fascinating qualitative work that I think also is always quite important in terms of the problems of quality. The problems of quality are not just about um, the quality of teachers, but infrastructure, um, resources, um, and the space that uh, schools uh, occupy, particularly uh, in low-income neighborhoods. The second big problem, I think, or big cost of inequality and big cost of the concentration of income at the top has to do with um, the insufficient investment in innovation and in research and development. 
And um, in my view, and, and we can discuss, this has a lot to do with not just the concentration of income, but the concentration of uh, business opportunities. Again, um, something that um, reports led by Luis Felipe and others have shown uh, in terms of the el economic elite controlling most of the most significant sectors of the economy. So in countries like Peru, for example, just two companies control the beer sector, just two companies control, um, uh, control telecommunications, um, and um, two companies control around 80% of milk uh, business, 70% of cooking oil, etc. So they both control those activities in the service sector that create more profits, but also um, have together with um, multinational corporations, the interest of the more leading sector. And when that's the case, their incentives, of course, uh, for them to move from sectors where profits are relatively high, um, protection from the public sector in terms of uh, limiting competition is also quite significant, are then the incentives to actually move um, to activities that might be more risky, where you are competing with China or with the US are actually very low. And again, here the work of Ben Schneider, for example, is quite um, nice in showing how um, basically, the lead, for example, in Chile, told him very clearly that um, they why would they actually move to other sectors of the economy? Why they would become the new Nokia's of Latin America when they were very making significant profits either in primary resources or in non-tradables? Um, of course, the other side of um, the um, private sector in Latin America is dominated by small and medium firms. Um, is the other phase of uh, inequality, um, which do not have either um, the resources or the capacity to uh, innovate. Um, and again, I'm calling this call economic cost because both low education and enough incentives in innovation, we know by the work of the ACLAG, by the work of UNDP and many others, that has translated in insufficient um, a grow, economic growth. Just to give you um, a final data on this issue, um, in Latin America it's not only that research and development is limited, but it's the private sector in particular the one um, that um, does particularly bad. So uh, in Latin America the um, private sector is responsible for one third of all uh, spending in research and development compared to 50% in Asia and 70% in OECD countries. The last cost um, is very much about taxation and here I'm working, worrying about the level of taxation, not only in terms of redistribution, but primarily in terms of having enough resources to spend in health, education, but also infrastructure that is needed for high economic growth. Um, Latin America uh, is, with the exception of Brazil and Argentina, um, have lower levels of taxation than you could expect based of, on their uh, GDP per capita. And that's particularly the case, of course, with income taxes. Um, for example, um, in the case of taxes on property, um, they represent or they represented in the mid 2000s only less than 1% of the total revenues in the country. And again, we know that this inability to tax is not uh, independent of inequality, but is very connected to the ability of the elite to shape political debates um, about taxation. Um, and this is very clear, for example, in the work that Tasha Fairfield has produced in terms of um, tax reforms in countries like Chile or Argentina. Um, it's very clear also in terms of the influence of the business elite in the electoral system and in the finance uh, of uh, political parties, but it's also very clear in the ability of that um, a elite to actually move capital abroad to tax havens and that way um, not pay um, taxes. So just to give you an indication um, based on data from the Tax Justice Network, um, the Tax Justice Network estimates that the amount of um, money hidden in offshore accounts uh, in the case of Brazil, it's equivalent to 160% of its foreign debt, 
In the case of Mexico, it's uh, equivalent to around 20, 224% of its foreign debt. And in the case of Venezuela, around 728%. So huge amounts of money that are in tax havens um, with very few constraints created by the state um, to the elite. The other thing that I try to Sorry, I'm not going to discuss much of this, but I would argue that um, in countries like the US, with all the difference, we start seeing some of these problems of unequal education, um, obviously much more innovation, but also rentist behavior by some of the large companies in the US and insufficient taxation as well. The other big component that I tried to discuss in the book very much borrowing obviously from a long tradition in development political economy and development economics is the idea that we also have vicious circles consolidating the uh, high inequality. So I have argued that inequality leads to low investment in education and innovation. That leads to lack of economic dynamism. But of course we know that this is in turn um, creates um, a dual labor market, um, or if you want in the uh, a, a, a terminology, a structural heterogeneity, um, that leads to very significant differences between some parts of the economy and other, um, leading to the perpetuation of inequality over time. And I think that's one of the reasons we need to think or worry about high inequality being very difficult to fight uh, uh, over the long term. So let me move and I have a look at the watch. So maybe George, you can tell me when, when I'm not doing particularly well of in time, but I think I, I should be fine. Um, so let me move to the political cost. So um, to why I say that high concentration on income in Latin America has led um, to political problems. Again, I think we need to think about this historically and think about the cycles of instability and also this continuous change in political regimes that have taken place um, in the region. Um, we tend to think about Latin America as a region of, and I don't think in this audience, but in the, some other cases of caudillos and of um, dictatorships. But the fact as Eduardo Posada, my colleague in Oxford and others have shown is um, Latin America started with using elections as a way to appoint its leaders from very early on, um, but it did it always uh, until um, the first half of the 20th century, at least, in what we can call limited democracy. And I'm using that term very much to um, refer to how far the region was from universal suffrage, suffrage so uh, voting, uh, but I'm also about all the conditions that were imposed on people and all the irregularities that took place in um, elections. Um, so I like some of the examples, for example, uh, in Chile, uh, or even in the beginning of the 20th century, um, both voters were in principle protected, but actually many times uh, it was the electoral authorities, the ones that put in the vote in public, um, therefore limiting the freedom of voting. Um, in the case of Colombia, uh, the, um, for a long time, the government moved the military to different regions to make sure that the votes in each of the regions was the ones that they wanted. Not surprisingly, this type of limited democracy that extends until at least the first third of um, the 20th century um, led both to um, public services, social spending in places like Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, where it emerged first, that was hugely segmented and that only favored a very small part of the population, um, led also to political violence um, against um, the labor movement. And therefore, not surprisingly, um, to what, um, with all the reluctance in the world, I'm going to, move, to call here uh, for short uh, populist responses. And by this, I mean very much uh, movements that try to go beyond the traditional political elite, try to build very close relations between the leader and um, the electorate, try to build rhetorics of them and us, uh, 
And um, contrary to the new populisms in the 21st century, are also have also redistributive components. Why do I say that populism um, was a cost of democracy? Uh, sorry, a cost of inequality. Because despite the clear commitment of some of these movements, I'm thinking about Perón, I'm thinking about Vargas um, and others to actually redistribute income, um, they were also um, hugely polarizing in terms of the institutional structure. Um, and they um, created, therefore, limited incentives to consolidate institutions that could redistribute income over the long run and also that could deepen democracy over the long run. It's very clear in the Latin American context that um, there's always, or they see the world as a trade-off between social rights and uh, political, the consolidation of political democracy. Of course, the other problem uh, or the other, um, the, the other problem of inequality in the region, it, and the, more, that the one that was more dramatic, um, was um, the response of the elite many times when they fret, be, thre, felt threatened by uh, populist movements. Let me here um, read a quote for, from Paul Drake, um, a political scientist that has written one of the best books on um, a political change in Latin America in the last two centuries. He says, the elite scrambled to co-opt or crush these movements, populist or popular movements, when the well-to-do fear the popular democracy, that popular democracy jeopardize upper and middle class privilege, they impose protected democracies or exclusionary authoritarianism. Some resorted to unusually barbaric dictatorships by their enforcing. Um, this struggle between an elite that was dominant and didn't want to uh, transfer power downwards and um, parts of the middle class that protested by trying to develop populist responses led to continuous changes in political regimes in Latin America during the 20th century. So actually, um, between 1950 and 1990, Latin America was responsible for 44 of the 97 political regime changes in the world. So for almost half of the changes in political regime that took place, and I think that's very much linked to uh, this concentration of income. Of course, this is not um, something just of historical terms. It's not that I am uh, a historian or that I want to discuss history of Latin America. In the last 20, 20 um, years, we have um, witnessed a very similar um, in cycle. So, um, again, as many of you know, Latin America was one of the uh, main players in the uh, third wave of democratization, starting with Ecuador in 1978 and finishing with Mexico in 2000. Um, and that um, led obviously to a different democracy than in the past, in the sense that now everyone had uh, the right to vote, but at the same time was also a very uneven and low quality um, democracy. And this was for a whole set of reasons, including the fact that there were authoritarian enclaves. This is very much the case in Chile, where the uh, Pinochet um, a constitution gave a lot of power to the military uh, in political institutions or through other formal and informal mechanisms and institutions that limited the ability of democracy um, to uh, be more redistributive and more radical in terms of policy options. Um, this, of course, led to uh, increasing uh, discontent with democracy. Between 1995 and 2001, um, the support for democracy in Latin America went down by 11 percentage points, um, so that by 2001, democracy uh, support was below 40% across the whole region, with many protests in uh, a large number of countries uh, from Ecuador to Bolivia, leading to a new phase of, um, again, with all the problems, um, populist um, leftist leaders, which I think showed exactly the same type of strengths and weaknesses 
um, that the previous populist uh, movements have shown. A strength, because there's a significant effort to expand um, the access to political and economic rights to new groups in the population, but also um, with much more interest in this expansion of the um, social state, if you want, than the consolidation of democracy. Um, and this is very clear when um, people like Morales said, we uh, arrive to the presidency to stay forever. Um, I'm obviously discussing uh, very broadly a whole set of issues, uh, but I do think, and I'm convinced that at the root of uh, political problems in Latin America are not just institutional weaknesses, but the concentration of economic resources leading to the concentration of political resources um, in the region. So economic inequality perpetuating political inequality um, in the type of cycle that uh, people like uh, Asimoglu and Robinson have also pointed out. And here, the problem is not only that uh, um, inequality leads to these uh, political um, changes all for all problematic, but at the same time that each of these political regimes has contributed to further inequality. Um, in the case of limited democracy, um, we have that precisely that inability of, um, to build um, the right political institutions, the strong political parties have led to insufficient levels of redistribution and insufficient capacity of the uh, low income groups and the middle class to influence um, the policy um, agenda. This is very clear uh, these um, last few weeks in um, the case of Peru um, and clear as well previously in the case of Chile. Um, in the case of um, populism, as we have discussed, the impact of populism inequality, I think it's more complicated um, because um, there has been clear efforts to redistribute income um, during these, many of these regimes. But at the same time, uh, they are love, I'm going to say, for political uh, polarization. And at the same time, their difficulties to respond to macroeconomic challenges has often led in the medium and long run uh, to crises that led to worsening or even inequality. And of course, the best example of um, the impact of political institutions on inequality has to do with the role of dictatorships. Um, some of Latin American dictatorships have been uh, machines to redistribute income, but in the wrong direction. Um, let me give you just one example that even if well known, I always, when I present, find uh, astonishing. Uh, in Chile, the Pinochet dictatorship uh, was able to change income distribution totally so that the income share of the highest decile increased from 34% in 1973 to 52%, 18 uh, percentage points in 1987, while the share of every other group in society, so not just the poor, but also the middle class and the upper middle class went down. Or we have obviously uh, the example of Brazil during the Brazilian miracle in which inequality increased very significantly. In the book, I also discuss social, um, the social cost, where I obviously discuss issues of violence and issues of uh, spatial, but also social segmentation and lack of trust that I think are uh, very significant and again, uh, have been explored by some um, of um, you in work, both for the World Bank, UNDP and others. So let me, um, so as I said, um, I was going to make the huge mistake of finishing here um, when I wrote the book and I'm glad that some colleagues reminded me that I couldn't and shouldn't perpetuate something that has been done in development studies for too long, which is thinking about parts of the global south as a problem and not as a solution. And in this case, I actually think that Latin America has significant lessons uh, that are much more positive and that we tend to forget. And here, let me actually start by um, complaining about Anglo-Saxon uh, authors, uh, literatures, um, and um, policy makers. Um, 
This is a quote from an advisor to Alexandro Casio Cortez. Um, as you know, they have discovered um, socialism. And he says, it makes sense that the two countries that fell to neoliberalism first may be the farthest along in organizing resistance to it. Anyone that has lived in Bolivia in the last three decades, Ecuador, Chile, um, can only laugh at uh, the Eurocentrism or US centrism in this case um, of um, the Anglo-Saxon approach. Because in fact, Latin America has been very interesting, I think in many ways, because it's a region that combines democratic tradition with high inequality. And that, that, that combination with all the weaknesses of the democratic tradition that we have discussed has led actually to very interesting um, examples in terms of ideas and in terms of actors in the region. Um, an ability to um, create a whole set of alternatives uh, to the status quo that are uh, extremely exciting. So in the book, I try to go, I try to adopt a multidimensional, um, multidisciplinary, sorry, perspective when discussing ideas. And I mentioned first structuralism. So structuralism in economics um, with both the notions of center and periphery, but also with Previsch um, saying something like this, much before Asimov and Robinson. Um, he said in the 1980s, capitalism in the periphery, and I'm quoting, promotes the concentration of economic power and inequality, and the concentration of economic power leads to concentration of political power in the most favored strata. So that's something that seems to be just from why nations fail, was very much uh, discussions that the structuralists were having by linking the center and the periphery in very exciting ways. But it's of course not just economics. Uh, if one thinks about religion, theology of liberation is very much a movement that is born in Latin America. It can only be understood by the unequal nature of many of the Latin American countries and became uh, one of the most interesting and successful attempts uh, in terms of uh, the social realm um, to develop a new uh, alternative and a new universe on thinking um, about um, alternatives. And of course, we also have, and I discuss in the book, uh, Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed and the huge contribution of Latin Americans to think about education as a way to develop new alternatives, uh, new alternatives for development. And I think all of these ideas, structuralism, theology of liberation, um, the, uh, and many others are actually very useful today um, to think about economic alternatives. In terms of actors, Latin America is um, the hotbed of some of the most uh, exciting social movements in the world. And I'm thinking here from the Lazarus movement, uh, to the mass in the case of Bolivia, um, to um, the, uh, in terms of the middle class movement, um, the student uh, movement in Chile. They are actually for me exciting, not only because of their huge size, um, as you know, the landless movement is one of the largest in the whole world, but because they have done certain things very well. For example, they have been very successful at linking very concrete needs, struggles for land, struggles for um, transportation, in the case of the student movement, um, a, a struggle for survival, in the case of the mass, with development alternatives and national debates. They have also linked political activism with training. Um, they have um, finally built very uh, dynamic, but also very autonomous moves, uh, links, sorry, to political parties. So in my view, if one wants to think about the role of social movements uh, in the world, it shouldn't go to the indignados in Spain or the, uh, to the 99% and the Occupy Wall Street in the US, but we should think very seriously about what are the lessons from the Latin American examples. And finally, uh, in terms of policies, I want to discuss that less because there's probably a slightly more controversial, but as you know, and as um, Luis Felipe, uh, together with Nora Lustig was one of the first to show um, Latin America in the 2000s 
was the region that uh, reduced inequality more than in any other parts of the world. A recent um, review SA shows that of the 27 developing countries that reduced inequality during the 2000s, almost half were actually from Latin America, and some of the ones that reduced inequality more were from Latin America. There's obviously a big dispute of how sustainable this was, um, how significant it was, but I think it has some significant lessons in terms of social programs, uh, but also in terms, for example, of the role of minimum wages. One cannot have a serious discussion about minimum wages across the world, in my view, without, for example, counting on the example of Brazil. So let me conclude. Um, I um, want to, I have tried to argue first um, that um, I don't think it's possible to uh, understand and to think about long-term development in Latin America without considering concentration of income at the top. I have talked a lot about inequality, but I have to be clear that for me, inequality in the region is particularly about the role of the wealthy. Um, that studying inequality uh, is Obviously, it's important to do the sophisticated econometric models about the reduction or increase that in 10 years, but it's also very important to think about the many dimensions and the historical perspective in the analysis. That I think the region has a lot of positive, but also negative um, lessons for the rest of the world. And in fact, uh, I hope we can discuss in the questions and answers um, to the extent to which actually what used to be a Latin American problem has become increasingly a, a global problem. Whether, as I say, for example, the US is increasingly witnessing some of the tendencies and trends that have been so typical of Latin America. And if this is the case, whether we should worry that high inequality might be perpetuating or might perpetuate over the long run through the same vicious circles that have dominated the region for so long. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diego Sanchez and Cochea. That was a fantastic presentation. Two, two comments before I send it over to Luis Felipe. One is uh, we appreciate very much the fact that you didn't uh, bombard us with graphs or, or, or numbers, but rather showed us sort of the, the train of your logic, how you see the hypothesis and how you navigate sociology, politics, economics. Uh, and the second thing is that, of course, for most of us who are working on these things, we tend to be optimists. We tend, in the development community, want, we want to take action, but we know that these are intractable problems, that there is no technical fix. And I think that what you succeed in doing very well is to communicate uh, how social norms, how institutions, how politics are behind uh, a lot of what we're seeing. So let me stop there and I'll open it up to our three fantastic panelists. I'll start with Luis Felipe Lopez Calva. Uh, over to you, Luis Felipe, for your advice and your view on the argument, but also on the future on inequalities in Latin America and in the world. Thank you so much, and uh, George, and uh, thank you to all the, uh, the panelists uh, also. Uh, upfront for, for the conversation and, and thank you to Diego for the, for the fantastic presentation. And I think I really want to very, very um, clearly say from the very beginning that the, the book is absolutely fascinating. I think very well deserved uh, recognition by Martin Wolf uh, as one of the top 20 best books in economics in 2020. So congratulations on a well deserved recognition. Um, I think it is a very important book and it will be a very important source of inspiration also for us uh, as we prepare the uh, regional human development report that will be launching in March, which is precisely about uh, inequality traps uh, and what are some of the links. So I want to say that uh, I really like the fact that the book has a very comprehensive and well uh, presented narrative about inequality and the interlinks with all, with you know the economics, the politics, and the social costs, uh, uh, among other things related to to violence, for example, and and the other is also um, how it compares to the rest of the world. I was as I was looking at at the content, I was thinking of my uh, in my experience when I was working in um, at the World Bank in Russia. Uh, uh, Several times I heard 
that the, la the labor markets in Russia and the economics in general in Russia were becoming Latin America. I mean, it was the Latin, America, Latin Americanization of a uh, Russian economy uh, 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 related to, uh, in a way, to the capture of certain sectors, to the dynamics of wage inequality, to the increasing levels of informality. So I think that is a very interesting uh, aspect that I didn't see in other works related to inequality. One element that I think the book brings uh, is the idea, when we talk about traps, it's very difficult to think where to start, because actually one of the problems actually with Asimov and Robinson's uh, work is that it's pretty pessimistic in the sense that uh, basically it's very difficult to break that cycle. And, and there is some discussion on the, on the origins, which you know you may agree or not. But I think I like Carlos, Carlos Botch, uh, uh, Democracy and Redistribution. And I think in a way you look into that by emphasizing the, the aspect of it is about the rich. Uh, uh, because I think the initial conditions really matter. So if you, we look at Carlos Botch's um, a book on democracy and redistribution, I think the elements that matter is the initial level of inequality in a way, the concentration of the ownership of assets and something very important, which is whether the assets are mobile. Uh, and that's an element that is not in Asimov and Robinson, but it's very clear in the modeling of Carlos uh, Bodge uh, book. So the mobility of assets matters because then if your assets are not mobile, uh, then you are gonna fight against redistribution more, more fiercely in a way. So in a way, some of the solutions that you find in terms of the political regimes are, uh, non-democratic solutions to prevent redistribution. And, that, and you, you, you present that very nicely uh, in, in your links to, to politics. Uh, so I, I, I think that that is a very um, consistent narrative with, with this idea of democracy uh, uh, and redistribution. So on the economic aspects, I would emphasize two things. One is at the end, you link it to the reduction in wage inequality uh, and I want to make two points here on the economics. First is uh, your book is very consistent with this idea that the redistribution that took place during the beginning of this century uh, is uh, on one hand, not really affecting the top, but rather uh, affecting the middle class, redistribution from middle classes to the poor at the margin, uh, which also explains the polarization, the political polarization in a way. Uh, and the other is, as I've, you know, I have shown in my work with Santiago Levy, that it's also um, the other cost is that it's negative for productivity because it's basically linked to growing informality and the lack of demand for high skills. So uh, that link, I think, is fundamental to understand policy implications. Um, and I like it very much. The other is somehow linked to, to the structuralist approach is that the, volatility, the macroeconomic volatility is also linked to inequality in the sense that when you have a resource boom or, or, or the positive cycle in terms of commodity prices, the demands for redistribution are so high that you start overspending. So in a way, the procyclical nature of spending is related to the high level of inequality and the political economy of the high level of inequality. So also volatility, which is an, a very consistent, I mean, a very characteristic feature of Latin American economies is also linked to inequality. And I think you, you uh, uh, link it to that uh, very well. I mean, not exactly related to volatility as such, but you present that very, very well. Um, you go back to um, uh, in time to present inequality as an old problem, but I just wanted to also mention that Alexander von Humboldt <laughs> in the early 19th century already said that Latin America was the land of inequality. And I refer to that because of, of this point of the trap. So the starting conditions really matter. And the high concentration of uh, asset ownership linked to, the co to, to colonization, uh, in a way, is a very lasting effect uh, of a uh, structural effect of, of the way colonization took place. Um, in, in our region, uh, and you, in a way, point, point to that. Um, 
finally, um, uh, a, a comment on, on the social movements. I really like your link on social movements. As you know, in the WDR on governance, we have a specific uh, uh, chapter on, on the importance of social movements as a driver of change. Uh, but I, I would like to, I mean, you have liked to see more about uh, uh, the, the, the actual impact in terms of redistribution. I think in Brazil, there was an effect on redistribution, but it never really led to uh, what makes it sustainable, which is a programmatic party structure. So in a way it became, it, it, it remained a clientelistic uh, political system in a way. I, th I think in my view, the most successful example in Latin America is Uruguay and the Frente Amplio. I think the transition after, the, after dictatorship in Uruguay and the coalition created by Frente Amplio led to a very objective uh, breakpoint, which is the fiscal reform of 2007. And that is a very lasting effect. And even today, I, can, I, can, I would argue that uh, Uruguay um, still has a more sustainable uh, uh, level of, of, of redistribution because of the creation of, of solid uh, programmatic party structure. And, uh, and I think one of the elements that is somehow missing is how we transition, uh, particularly in a context now with the crisis of political representation that we are facing, how we can transition to more programmatic party structure rather than the current equilibrium, which is very clientelistic, uh, no? which, which in a way is a non-democratic solution to the redistribution problem. So, and, and I close here, going back again to Carlos Botch. At the end, the way you transition to democracy in a sustainable way has to be accompanied by a sustainable policy for redistribution. Otherwise, uh, democracy and redistribution cannot coexist. And you will find always either imperfect redistribution or imperfect democracy. And in my way, perhaps the only, um, I, I would, we can discuss Costa Rica, which is a different example, but, but in the, I would say in the, in the last 30 years, a transition that seems to be in that direction would be Uruguay. Uh, and uh, more, than, more, than, more than Brazil, even though, of course, we saw effects on Brazil. So it, it's such a fascinating book that I could speak for hours about this. There are many things that called my attention, so I hope I made a reasonably structured uh, comment, but uh, I will continue reading it and learning from it, uh, Diego, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luis Felipe, and I'll ask Diego to hold his fire for a second if he, if he wants to comment on any comments. I'll pass it over to Linda and also to Joy, and then we'll, we'll go back to you, Diego, after, after the third comment. So over to my colleague, Linda McGuire. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, she had a very insightful article uh, in the summer about the case for governance, so I just wanted to prod her on that if possible. But uh, it's over to you, Linda. Thank you so much for your comment. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you, Diego. And great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I really enjoyed, Diego, the, the presentation and the, the chapter of the book, because I think it's very refreshing to have this kind of political economy, socio-political economy analysis of inequality um, beyond, you know, income inequality and really looking at the, the implications, the impacts, but also the, the positive lessons. And, um, you know, if Latin America is sort of the canary in the coal mine for um, the rest of the world, perhaps, um, it, it sort of behooves us to, to pay attention to, to what you're saying, sort of passed as prologue. Um, so I was, I was most taken, um, as you can imagine, from George's introduction to the political implications and the governance, you know, what is the future of governance given all of that analysis you presented. Um, and I like very much your focus on, you know, it's not a sort of depersonalized institutional relationship. We're talking about the impact of inequality on people you know, on human capital, on the opportunities that are open to them, a, a kind of capabilities approach, if you will, you know, a la Amartya Sen. Um, and therefore how people um, are being impacted by inequality and then what they think about democratic institutions, about values and how, you know, how that shifts when you are under the pressure that inequality brings. And I, I liked that analysis very much. Um, and I would say that, you know, maybe one um, kind of question is about data, 
because um, you know we've looked at the data, uh, Latino barometer, and and you know sort of perceptions about the effectiveness of governance institutions, and it's very hard to kind of come out with a correlation, you know, between actual income inequality if you're looking at a Gini coefficient and people's level of confidence. What we do know is, you know, support in Latin America for democracy does still tend to be, um, you know, fairly uh, high, particularly among people who, I should say, who label themselves as lower middle class or middle class, which makes, you know, the point that Luis Felipe makes in many other contexts about the importance of a middle class society in Latin America, all the more important. If, if that's where your support is coming, um, but the middle class is being squeezed or not being developed enough. Um, you see theoretical support for, you know, the concept of democracy, but very low level of confidence in how that's actually being implemented in, in countries in Latin America, both low levels of confidence in actual democracy um, and also in, in their economies. So I think, you know, more country level, country specific analysis on that kind of intersection between uh, economy, uh, institutions of governance, and uh, inequality would, would be interesting. And I think that is work that um, Luis Felipe and Marcela are doing in the regional human development report. So I look forward to seeing that. Um, but I'm also, uh, you know, interested, Diego, in all the sort of commentary you make about why, um, you know, unequal a distribution of political influence, how that impacts um, on, on citizens. And I, I remember a quote from Robert Dahl, I think, that said something about a, a key characteristic of democracy is the continuing responsiveness of governments to the preferences of their citizens, which they consider as political equals. And what you describe in the book is this kind of, you know, um, a very unequal distribution of that or concentration, if you will, of that political influence in the hands of few and perhaps the most affluent citizens. Um, and, and therefore the preference in policy uh, kind of it adheres there and not towards the preferences um, of poorer citizens, if you will. So I think, um, you know, what you mentioned in your presentation, the, the consolidation of electoral systems and processes have meant equality of participation, perhaps, at least theoretically, but not equality of outcomes and not equality of opportunities. And that's, that's what we're seeing in the erosion, I think, of confidence um, in democracy as a result of, of, um, of inequality. And I think very interesting your point on um, that seldom can politics and economics be separated um, and I think the, the book and your presentation makes this point repeatedly and to me it's interesting perhaps to drive it home even further that looking at it not so much as the economic perspective that okay markets are uh, are not correcting for this and inequality is having perverse incentives and results but looking at it from a governance perspective what we're talking about if if economy and politics merge is minority rule. You're talking about the rule of a few over the many effectively. And that that is concerning. And I think it's it's much more alarming when it's put in those terms. And and perhaps um, you know unpacking that a little bit more. And so implications, you know, I think we're gonna see, continue to see different kinds of citizen involvement because of uh, inequalities. And in Latin America, I would say it doesn't it won't necessarily look like less citizen involvement, but I think you will see different kinds um, because there is that strong tradition of social activism, of social movements. In a country like Panama, there's a strong tradition of dialogue. Um, so you'll see increasing demand, I think, from the street, from uh, citizens and from you know residents to redefine social contracts and that that's good but when it's combined with a low confidence of, in institutions it, it does become problematic um, you know inequality also leads we've seen Stieglitz and others have talked about lower confidence in business or distrust in business and that's going to be a net you know uh, loss for everyone um, and one thing I find concerning in the research globally, um, and I think you allude to it perhaps, but perhaps more nuanced in Latin America is that as inequality goes up, tolerance tends to go down. 
and you know the inverse is true that as prosperity increases tolerance can tend to go up and if tolerance is a main you know tenant and pillar of democratic societies the ability to listen to others um, that that should be of concern uh, to everyone as an implication of of more inequality and i won't belabor your populism point but just to say very interesting what you talk about that the the um, tendency towards populism, not just of people, but but elites as well, this willingness to perhaps step out of an established institutions and processes. So um, I like too that you talked um, again in the chapter um, about that the elite have never shown a willingness, I think you say, to strengthen state capacity or promote effective anti-corruption measures. On the one hand, while social movements tend not to have the, the power to advance reform agendas. So I think that points us in a direction as well for strong institutions, um, but also the, um, the sort of, uh, you know, new narrative, I think, and COVID-19 is pushing us to have this sort of new narrative, I think, of democracy and the, its ability to, to reboot and kind of uh, address this complex juncture. Because um, I think we're going to see um, perhaps, you know, the future of governance, what does it look like? I think, um, you know, the old left-right kind of dichotomy, um, we're seeing that perhaps disappear a little bit um, in Latin America. You, you don't necessarily have political parties who, first of all, have a lot of confidence, but secondly, adhere to a kind of left, right, and center. You see a lot of independent candidacies. Um, so the future of political parties, I don't think they'll disappear, but it'll be interesting to hear from you where you think they're going vis-a-vis -vis the, the inequality discussion and the lack of confidence discussion um, and the representative democracy, confidence in representative democracy and the greater push for more direct forms of democracy, be they, you know, through expressing voice and social media, which is, has all of its own challenges to, um, you know, wanting to abolish things like uh, national assemblies and parliaments and so forth. So maybe if George, you'll allow me just one more um, or last reflection on um, this isn't necessarily part of the discussion, but I think it's interesting on given everything that, you know, Diego has presented, what, what might it mean for UNDP, um, you know, for our work in governance, um, particularly at the country level, which is where I'm speaking from. And I think, you know, taking a two pronged approach, at least um, in doubling down on the whole democratic institutions and processes work and not letting our guard down on that because you still need that channel that lane of participation you need strong institutions that can interface and provide services education health water electricity um, and processes uh, like electoral systems like the justice uh, process and so forth but at the same time you need the policies and Diego talks a lot about this in his presentation and in, in the chapter. You need pro, uh, policies that will result in a more fair, just uh, distribution of resources, and not just financial resources of the economy, but resources like education, health, power. You know, who accesses and, and exercises power? And how do you get that reduced inequality of opportunity and outcomes as well. So I think UNDP can be an honest broker, you know, help the state and citizens have that discussion, offer those spaces which are nonpartisan, but not neutral. You know, they are value-based spaces where, um, you know, equality matters and, and needs to be promoted and a diversity of ideas and the ability to listen um, is important. And the ability to listen gets less as well as inequality gets higher and capture of resources gets more pronounced. UNDP is a generator of ideas, of policy options, and UNDP is an integrator. We talk about that a lot, but you know, Diego talks about very complex intersections of, of policy. So if you're talking about increasing socioeconomic mobility, you need to talk about the intersection of tax policy, of the care economy, of social protection systems, of education, labor markets. You know, there are very few, in my opinion, institutions who can operate with that level of, of complexity and integration um, aside from UNDP. So I'll just leave it there and thank you again. Thank you so much, Linda, and thank you for that catalyst thinking piece on UNDP's role, which I think is critical for our work.
Uh, let me move to our colleague, Joy, who has been working on trade, investment, industry, jobs in Africa. Uh, and Joy, over to you on your reflections on lessons from Latin America, if there are any, and also how you see the inequality debate from where you sit. Over. Thank you very much, George. Good afternoon to you all. Professor, it's been a pleasure to listen to you. I read chapter one of your book and I think it gave quite a good picture of what the issues are that you've articulated in a bit more detail here. In reading your chapter, I thought that perhaps what's interesting to bring to this conversation is this question of inequality in Africa, where we thought we were making progress, what the setback has looked like and how we get out of it at this point in time. And so in a sense, my comments are really about what is the new type of thinking in how we can defeat inequality in Africa. And my ideas will really be on the economic side. So the starting point is that inequality is no stranger to the continent. I think in Africa, we've always had this complex dichotomy of great numbers of GDP growth, impressive numbers, you know, the fastest growing economies in the world, 10 of them are from Africa and we have double digit growth. And we hope that this is going to reach a point where it produces those goods and those services that can start to dent poverty. But I think the reflections and the analysis tell us an opposite story, which is that most of the decades of growth on the continent have largely been jobless. And so when you talk about it like that, you say, in fact, that most of the growth has been pushing inequality. And so what is the solution? Already we start to see where the solution is, because you ask yourself, what are the underpinnings of that growth? And then you start to see what the corrective measures would look like. And I'll get to that in a point. So we speak about these lions in the move. We speak about great progress. And then we start to ask ourselves a question, but what does it look like on the inequality space? And some of the best numbers now come from UNDP's own human development report of 2019, where we started to see a bit of a nuance again in terms of inequality. Largely, the continent still struggles, but I think you started to see an African country in the top highest income sort of bracket, you start highest human development bracket, you started to see four African countries in the middle. So you have your Kenya there and so on and so forth. You started to see 12 countries somewhere in the low human, in the medium human development group. And what this tells you also from an inequality perspective is that you're starting to see a shrink countries like Lesotho, Gambia, Ethiopia, Eswatini. This gives a promise that it is possible in a sense. And you ask yourself, what are these countries doing so that it takes you somewhere to the answers? But as you start to celebrate this idea of a shrinking inequality on the continent, if you see it from the perspective of the basic capabilities, COVID changes all of that because COVID has had a huge setback on the African economy. And even worse still, COVID has dented precisely those levers and those vehicles that one would rely on to reboot the economy. What do I mean by this? I mean that Africa's economies, largely commodity exporters, have had a hit $100 billion taken off commodity exporters. Antad has told us $500 billion in lost export earnings. They're also telling us 40% reduction in, in foreign direct investment, which is a critical financing issue for the continent. But when we take it out of the big numbers and start to say, what does it mean for people? Three quarters of jobs in the non-formal sector very much at risk. And when you look as well at what the IMF is telling us about incomes precisely, they're saying 200 billion wiped off the incomes on the continent. And that is people. Let's take it back to the state now and the capacity of states to put the corrective measures. And what we see is an even more difficult task right now because much of Africa is in debt. Many countries on the continent were already distressed before COVID-19 and a series of publications have come out to confirm that. But I think what COVID-19 does is push Africa effectively into a space of debt where countries like Ethiopia, you know, countries like Zambia, Mozambique, ETC, highly distressed, highly in debt, already defaulting. What this means is that the resources, the public press that will be needed to correct these measures is broke. What then do we do? And this will be my last set of points. We look at those types of instruments, which when strengthened, can widen the scope and the net of the beneficiaries in the economy so that people taking their own risks taking their own capacities, utilizing their talents, can defeat poverty, can break these cycles of inequality. I'd like to talk about trade as the first one. 
Now, you know, Africa, I guess, well, as the world looks inward and tries to think about export bans and so on and so forth, I think Africa is the last bastion, perhaps the only standing space right now in terms of multilateralism. We are four weeks away from the start of trading of the African continental free trade area. This is critical because there you're looking at reducing, dismantling barriers to intra-African trade in 90% of tariff lines. Now, we know that the numbers are low, 18%, but we also know that in that 18% is a lost opportunity of the difference to 100. And so when we start to break the barriers to intra-African trade, we will start to see more of that which COVID has demonstrated, that within closed borders, within broken supply chains, Africa can actually produce. And so a trade policy that nurtures this type of production, a trade policy that works in a framework of reduced barriers to intra-African trade will create jobs and will allow people to fight inequality. That is the first point. The second point I'd like to make is around the role of investment. And investment is critical, not just investment, foreign direct investment coming into the continent, precisely because that type of investment is problematic largely because it focuses on the extractives. The type of intra-African investment we're talking about is investment in those sectors where people are, those sectors that can create jobs. And so investment in telecom, investment in construction, investment in transport, investment in education, investment in health, and so on and so forth. The type of investment we're seeing when Africans invest in different countries on the continent. This is critical because it will allow, again, for the financial muscle to push and propel the sort of economic activities that can fight inequality. The third generation of points I'd like to make is around sustainable financing. You see, in Africa, we talk about a situation where we need to start to think about the sustainability question amidst low levels of ODA and amidst the reality of shrinking ODA. And so in that space, we have to start to think about how to tackle those, those obstacles that get in the way of Africa's money financing the continent's development. And here I'd like to talk about the need to stem illicit financial flows, over 80 billion lost annually from the continent to the rest of the world. What if we stemmed those financial flows? What if we had the proper taxation regimes? What if we had the right legal instruments? What if we use that as a space then to keep the resources, the financing of the resources from the continent to start to add value on the continent? The argument therefore is that once we start to stem illicit financial flows, once we start to look at interesting partnerships, and once we start to think about how ODA can be blended together with private sector engagement to propel that value addition, to propel that diversification, we will start to democratize the space of who can benefit from Africa's resources within the continent. We will start to widen the space of how many people on the continent can engage in those productive sectors that can allow for them not to have to rely on the state for any handouts of any sorts. And so the point therefore is that there is a role in tackling inequality in Africa by boosting intra-African trade, boosting intra-African investment, and really tackling those systemic questions around financing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Joy. Uh, we have a rich set of comments. Uh, Diego, over to you for a quick response, if you'd like, from the three comments, and then we'll open it up to, to our audience. Over to you. Yes, yeah, so it, it will be very, very quickly. Thank you so much for your comments. I have a whole list of things to, um, to actually think about now that the, my, my teaching and administration term is almost over and I can be a thinking human being again. Um, just four key points I think that 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 are are important as as complements more than as responses. I take Linda's and Luis Felipe's question as um, as much as we need to think about economic responses, we need to think about how do we create real democracies. That the question that um, at the end, in context that as Linda said, are of um, a rule by the minority. It's about how you create real democracy. And I think, um, Linda, I like your, the fact that you then start thinking, okay, protest, because that, that's the immediate response, right? The immediate response from many of us when we want to be optimistic is the region is protesting. So this creates all kinds of opportunities. But you say, and I think totally right, well, actually protest without political parties and with lack of trust might actually just be uh, uncertainty and volatility. I guess I don't have a lot to add other than in your responses, I think we have a huge discussion to have around whether we want think that normatively, 
the way to respond to this is direct democracy. So whether expanding the spaces for direct democracy is the answer or whether strengthening political parties in a traditional way, in the way Luis Felipe was saying, um, is the response. And we can obviously say it's both, but I think that's a huge debate to have. Are we in a very different world in the 21st century or are we still uh, in the 20th century which building democracy is about creating programmatic political parties. I have to say that in the end of the book, I feel always very unoriginal compared to, always when I think about George, I think about someone original, when I think about me, very unoriginal, because I go back to the 20th century. I think the, the programmatic political parties remain the key, um, and I don't have any clear response of how you think about them, partly because what we see is that in those countries that it existed, uh, think about the US, it's increasingly not existing. I do think that looking at Uruguay is key. I think, uh, and George is going to forgive me, I do think that thinking about the mass critically, but with a lot of detail is very important for the good and bad that the mass brings. I'm very conscious of the bad, but I think it brings new ways of thinking about the links between political parties and social movements that we need to understand much more. So in terms of what you were saying, Luis Felipe, I would take Uruguay and, and Bolivia as the, the key countries to think much more seriously in the context. Finally, um, uh, from what Joy was saying, just a couple of things. First, I think Joy, what, what you were saying about uh, the problem of COVID, it's actually a fascinating discussion that is behind the book, but I don't make it as explicit, which is how much the categories of Global South versus Global North are valid in the 21st century. And I have actually a big debate with a colleague, non a, non a political economist, but uh, a development which is convinced that the categories are no longer useful and actually create all kinds of problems. And I hope it's clear by my book, I, part of me agrees, but part of me fundamentally disagrees in the sense that, yes, the US is increasingly like Latin America, but when it actually needs, it has to do countercyclical policies, it can spend billions of dollars, which as you were saying very clearly, neither Africa nor Latin America can do in this current context. And very much thinking about in which ways the world, the world has become less about center and periphery and in which ways these categories are important um, is extremely um, significant, important. And then I will leave you, I, I, I wrote all about your policy responses, which I think is interesting. I guess I would ask you to what extent in all of these policies, we need to continue distinguishing between those policies that are about developing further the leading sectors of the economy, those that are going to be at the frontier, versus how we bring the rest of the economy with us and whether actually we need to think about different types of alternatives for um, those two groups um, of the of the private sector. So let me stop here so we can have plenty of time for questions and comments from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diego. We already have a couple of questions from the audience. I'll pass it over to Samantha so maybe she can help us read those too. And if either Johanna or John want to jump in, uh, they're also welcome to do so. Over to you. Great, thanks George and thanks all for the wonderful conversation and insights you've shared thus far. Um, our first question is from John. Um, and John, feel free, yeah, if you'd like to jump in here and ask your own question, but I'll read it verbatim as it stands. Um, Thomas Pictey raises in his latest book, the need to democratize the economy by allowing workers to participate in boards of directors to reduce the income gap. Isn't that the political key, the democratization of the economy? So um, I actually read almost the whole book because I, I'm participating in a special issue that reviews the book. Uh, and I say almost because it's impossible with Piketty, at least for me to finish the whole thing. Um, and I agree, but I find Piketty quite frustrating in that he's a political economist with polit without politics, right? In the sense that here he shows um, this huge role of um, ideas, but I think also he shows implicitly that ideas are dominated by political power. I mean, he basically tries to convince us that that's not the case, but I think implicitly is very clearly the case that those ideologies are driven by uh, 
political power by, by the government of the minorities in many parts of the world that he shows. And then he has the chapter of um, political, oh, sorry, of policy options in which politics totally disappears. So the question is, for me, is how do you actually democratize the economy in a way that you will be able to convince the elite that that's possible? Um, what are the instruments, the, pro, the, the mechanisms? Uh, is it about direct democracy as we were discussing? Is very much about strengthening political parties once again? Um, is it about having people on the street? Um, what are the mechanisms through which the very good policies that he has, both in terms, as you say, on democratization of the economy, but also in terms of taxation, will be made possible. And and I just missed in the book that there was there was he he he's as I say he's a political economist without politics. And um, as long as we don't solve the political uh, problem, I think we we will struggle to how we are going to 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 implement those policies. Maybe John, you can. Um, hi, uh, do you mind if I explain myself in, in Spanish or is, no, okay, uh, sí. it's better for me. Okay, well, eh, efectivamente la, las propuestas políticas de Piketty <coughs> eh, no están del todo cerradas. Yo sí me he estudiado, eh, bueno, me estudié todo el libro escrito sobre él y es verdad que el Realmente lo que propone que es el socialismo participativo, básicamente lo que son las propuestas se quedan en temas muy generales. Pero a mí lo que me parece interesante y es una, un tema a, a reflexionar es que los procesos de democratización del Estado siempre han fracasado porque la economía eh, no está democratizada. Es un poco lo que va implícito en su discurso. Entonces, quizás... Eh, deberíamos abordar primero el democratizar la economía que democratizar el Estado. Porque recientemente había un encuentro sobre esta cuestión y era la gran pregunta que terminaba haciendo todos los participantes en el encuentro es ¿cómo democratizamos el Estado? Esa es la clave y el problema fundamental de las democracias latinoamericanas. Pero claro, la, aquí entra Piketty, que a pesar de no ser muy concreto en sus policies, como bien señalas, si plantea que antes de democratizar el Estado tenemos que democratizar la economía. Es decir, él plantea claramente que las brechas, de, si el primer detector, la primera alarma, el primer semáforo que tenemos para la desigualdad son la desigualdad de ingresos, ¿cómo abordar la desigualdad de ingresos? Pues que los trabajadores puedan participar en el diseño de las políticas salariales de las empresas. Mientras los trabajadores no puedan participar en esas políticas por medio de los consejos de administración y por diferentes canales de participación, las brechas de ingresos van a seguir creciendo y van a seguir ampliándose. Entonces, en ese sentido, aunque el libro es tremendamente extenso, son 1.200, 1.400 páginas y las soluciones no están claramente fijadas, sobre todo las soluciones políticas, me parece eh, fundamental eh, plantear esta, este elemento. ¿no? Yo creo que es, es todo muy multidimensional y todo es muy complejo, pero ¿qué hay que democratizar primero? ¿La economía o la política? Yo considero y Piketty considera que es la economía. No, no, y luego la política, desde luego no hay que, pero sí hay que priorizar, es la, porque los, los intentos de democratización del Estado siempre se han frustrado. Gracias, John. Por, Muchísimas perdón. gracias. Eh, Diego, I'll ask you to, to respond a little bit later to that. Well, we have a couple of more questions. I'll ask Samantha to, to share uh, Joanna's question, and we've got one from Indrajit. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this comes from Joanna and says, Professor Sanchez, thank you for an insightful presentation. What suggestive evidence could be provided on the link between long lasting inequality of opportunity, for example, inequality due to circumstances and access to quality education and increasing social unrest in Latin America and the Caribbean? Thank you. Uh, you're muted, Diego. Sorry. Do you want me to answer that or to take in Rajit's as well? Let's go ahead with the second question. Let's go to Indrajit as well, and then you can you can okay. 
Absolutely. Um, the final question is, thanks for that elegant presentation, a question and a comment. The comment, thanks for the discussion of the role of elites in right-wing populism, which much of the analysis misses sadly. The question, great that you refer to the lessons that the global north can learn from Latin America. What would be the best ways to communicate these lessons to the north, especially the USA, which assumes that they all have they have all the lessons and good practices for the world to emulate. Fascinating, fascinating question. So, um, Joanna, I don't, um, and I don't know that I have anything um, particularly um, particularly interest, particularly new to say, um, other than. I'm a little bit skeptical about uh, the agenda that focuses on inequality opportunities um, uh, or only at the inequalities opportunity, either in terms of normative analysis. So we have a whole set of analysis about um, uh, in, in political theory, based very much on the importance of uh, the opportunities, but also in terms of the actual practice and. I'm thinking about the, the work of Francisco Ferreira and others, partly for the reasons we have discussed in part, right? That um, in governments and political systems of the minority, using Lina's, um, uh, Linda's um, terminology, it's actually very difficult to think that just opportunities uh, in terms of health, education, etc., are the key. And it's almost impossible to not think in that um, the structure of the household, um, the place where you have, the, the type of access that you have to the labor market, the type of networks um, that exist uh, are not important. And this, for example, I, a former student, um, Haley Jones, that work on the um, long-term implications of Bolsa Familia, from a more qualitative perspective, shows very clearly um, that um, the, the increasing education in the absence of changes in the labor market and in the absence of changes in networks and the capacity to enter into networks, that's relatively little. So, so for me, the inequality of opportunity needs to always be together with thinking about what's the broader structure that is um, weakening some of these um, elements. But there's very much no doubt that uh, it's part of the, of the important agenda. Um, Intrajit, um, Thank you very much for, for your comments. In terms of the question, I wish I knew. Um, I, think, I think part of the, um, I guess it's twofold. Um, I, I think, sorry, no, I partly know, which is in terms of universities, I think this is where the decolonization agenda plays a particularly important role. I see, um, institutions like Oxford, but maybe also UNDP, um, partly as institutions that need to give a space, credibility, and voice um, to the people that are working um, in the global south and um, need to use different mechanisms to do so. Um, and it's not just about inviting people, it's very much about valuing the type of work that is being produced um, as center. And as soon as we um, value that work. I think we will also have some of the discussions and examples being treated more seriously, but it's not going to be easy. And as I say, I, I was just fascinated by this issue that even if the left, not just the mainstream, but the left in the US, things that they have discovered, socialism and anti-neoliberalism, um, when obviously it has been present in the region. And finally, John, I fully agree, but I guess I think we need more work on what comes first historically and on how easy it is to democratize the economy without having political, uh, political pressures, right? So, and, and I think it would be fascinating for me to treat exactly your sentence to think, for example, about Sweden, right? Um, what where clearly the process at the beginning of the 20th century is very complicated because those two things are almost taking place at the same time. But I think that's exactly, for me, how you phrase it is exactly what should lead to a whole set of, of um, actual empirical work about how these things have developed over time and, and what are the levers uh, in one case or the other to try to think about this issue.
Thank you, Diego. We're right at the end of our time, but we'll allow the last bonus question from uh, Vanessa Hidalgo, who focuses on, you know, in recent years, emerging middle class societies have focused a lot on income based redistribution. But what about the wealth tax? What about thinking of assets, wealth, or patrimony? Uh, do you have any opinion on that discussion, such as the Bolivian debate today? Um, so obviously, this is, would be the answer. Uh, something for Luis Felipe, as much as me, given that he has done so much work on um, the middle class. I would say two things: um, one about the politics, and one about the narratives. So about the politics, I do think that at the heart of um, some of the things that we have discussed in terms of developing new democracy, etc. And again, I'm borrowing here from the work of Luis Felipe, among others is whether the middle class see itself as someone that will benefit from um, creating cross-class coalitions to low-income groups or see itself as aspiring to be the, the new rich of Latin America. Um, and this is obviously um, very significant for the work that I have done with Juliana Martinez on universalism. And it's, it's, it's key in terms of where the region is. Unfortunately, I'm thinking several of the countries, the, the middle class is only looking upwards and not looking uh, for coalitions, and that makes um, taxation of um, this type much more complicated. I think the second is, is, is about narratives. I actually think that um, the work of Saez, Piketty, and others has the huge potential of shift narratives about what is economically viable and just, but that we need to do much, much more work on this issue of how we build narratives around the wealth tax being about being modern, being about um, creating a new um, democracy. And I actually think this is linked, by the way, to um, how we think about narratives also about COVID. So I always say that at the moment, we have the opportunity to think about COVID as a social crisis with fiscal consequences or as a fiscal crisis with social consequences. I hope that we can continue thinking about it as the former because then thinking about taxation as a social imperative becomes much more important. But I have to say that um, I, I, I think in the audience there's probably people much more capable to think about some of these issues that, that I am. Well, thank you so much, Diego Sanchez and Cochea. We had a fascinating conversation. I also want to thank uh, Joy and Linda and Luis Felipe. I think many of the things that you touched upon are part of the, the agenda that we are discussing and taking action on in UNDP. Uh, but I think it's very welcome to think about history, to think about time, to think about politics, society, and economics interlinked and the messiness of that. And I, uh, I do appreciate that very much from your work and from the book. We're all very interested in following up on this. This will not be the last session. So just a big thank you to you, to our panelists, and a big thank you also to Samantha Happ and to Renetta Rubian for hosting this. This is the Community of Practice of Poverty and Inequality at UNDP. Thank you, everyone, for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us we'll be today. We'll in touch. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.